Hello, this is Pastor Gavin Whitcomb from Morris Mountain Church near Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, in the greater Harrisburg area in South Central Pennsylvania. Thanks for joining my podcast. You ready to dig into the Word? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your many blessings. Your Word is truth. Now as we seek after you and want to know and understand your thoughts and your ways, we pray you'd guide us and bless this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we've been going through the book of Ephesians verse by verse. And, uh, you know, there's some verses that uh, I think it behooves us to spend more time on because they're so, um, so practical in their application. So they're, they're more uh, practically relevant than other passages. And Ephesians chapter 6 here is one of those. And he, in Ephesians 6, he tells us, be, be finally, he says, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And he, he says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So we've been talking about the armor of God, and uh, he talks about having our loins girt about with truth. And so he speaks of a belt, have on the belt of truth, since Satan is a liar and a deceiver. If we have the belt of truth on, it helps us to be able to discern his lies and truth from error, right from wrong, and so we can be uh, protected against his deceptions. And uh, he says we have to have on the breastplate of righteousness. Simply doing what's right and obeying God provides spiritual protection from uh, uh, all sorts of evils. And so this morning, uh, in verse 15, this brings us to the next item of our spiritual armor. And that's, he says, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, to have your feet shod means you have something on your feet. I can remember as a little boy, my mother, uh, in the wintertime, I'd say, Boy, Mommy, I, I'm in cold. She said, Well, you, you need to get something on your feet. And sometimes I wouldn't, I'd be running around in my bare feet. She'd say, You need to have something on your feet. It'll help keep you warm. Well, we're to have something on our feet. We're to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, by the, the gospel of peace, we're going to look into what he means by preparation of the gospel. But first, let's define the gospel of peace. The gospel of peace is the same thing as the gospel of Christ or the gospel of the grace of God. Gospel means good news. And the reason it's called the gospel of peace is because the gospel brings peace to us. In other words, our sins make us at war with God, but when we come to God through faith in Christ and we embrace the gospel, we believe the gospel of Christ and we receive the Christ whom the gospel proclaims, then we have peace with God. Now, Paul derives this imagery of the gospel of peace and beautiful feet and all that, and your feet um, shod with the gospel from Isaiah 52, verse 7. Let me read this, and you'll see what I'm talking about. Isaiah 52, 7, where Paul associates the feet with carrying the gospel. He says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace. Now, good tidings, good news, the gospel means good news or good tidings. That publisheth peace. So it's, it's talking about, hey, we can have peace with God. We can be forgiven and reconciled to him. That brings good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation. Talks about salvation. Okay, so now uh, it says, That saith unto Zion, 
thy God reigneth. So even though sin is in the earth, uh, you know, God is still on the throne and he still reigns. So uh, Isaiah talks about how beautiful upon the mountains are the, the feet of him that brings good tidings and publish peace. So Paul derives some of this imagery from Isaiah, you know, the feet carrying the gospel, the feet carrying good news. You see, it, it's called the gospel of peace because it announces how through salvation, through faith in Christ, we can have peace with God. You know, whether you realize it or not, the scriptures tell us that our sins made us God's enemies. We were rebels who were at war with him. But through the gospel, we can have peace with God. Uh, let me just read to you a few passages of scripture that make this very clear. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Romans 5, 8 through 10, God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, did you catch that? See, we were under the wrath of God, the righteous wrath of a, a, a holy God because of our sin. But through Christ, we are saved from wrath. For if, he goes on to say in Romans 5.10, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now notice, it says we were enemies. So we were under the wrath of God, we were enemies, but then the gospel came. And the gospel of Christ, how he died for our sins and rose again and offers us the gift of eternal life as a gift by his grace. We receive it through faith and receive him by faith, and then we can have peace with God. Colossians 1, 20 through 22 says the same thing, only in a little bit different wording. Now notice the nuance of, of difference, but yet the same truth from just a little slightly different angle. Colossians 1, 20 through 22. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. What's he mean he reconciled all things in heaven and all things in earth? Well, you and I who are saved, he reconciled us to God uh, through the death of his son. Okay, we've been reconciled to God. But things in heaven were reconciled to God through Christ's death. Like how could heaven and God uh, forgive uh, guilty sinners? Well, when Jesus died on the cross, that made it possible that God could, be, God could reconcile himself to lost sinners um, because our sins had been righteously paid for through what Jesus did. So, it says, And you that were sometimes alienated, sometimes means at one time, we were, we were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. So we were the enemies of God in our mind by wicked works. Just the way that we thought was an enmity against God. And our works were enmity against God. We were enemies of God. <clears throat> but he says, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Okay, so uh, that's, that's why it's called the gospel of peace, because it announces how we can have peace. Now, Roman sandals had small spikes on the bottom to help soldiers hold their ground by providing good traction. You know, I've seen soccer players already that wore uh, shoes that had little spikes in them. Uh, I don't think these were, as, you know, pictures I've seen of them. They're not as long as like soccer spikes, but there were little projections that came out of the bottom of their sandals. 
and that would help them to hold firmly to the ground and give them good traction. Well, when it says your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, what does he mean by preparation? Well, the word preparation means readiness. You know, Jesus used the word when he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. See, the idea of preparedness, readiness. He has a place all ready for us in heaven. So, <clears throat> what does it mean, the preparation of the gospel of peace? Well, preparedness. We need to be prepared or ready to take our stand for the gospel, to both defend the gospel, <clears throat> and also to proclaim the gospel. <clears throat> now let me read to you here Philippians 1 verse 7 and Philippians 1 17. Paul says, uh, he says, inasmuch as both in my bonds, in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye all are partakers of my grace. Notice he mentions the defense of the gospel, that's defended it against attacks, and confirmation of the gospel. He confirms it by proclaiming it throughout the world. And, uh, and, and then Philippians 1.17 says, But the other of love, knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. He says, hey, I'm going to defend the gospel. Okay, so, so <clears throat> our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace means that we stand in the gospel. We stand ready to defend it against attacks. And we stand ready to carry it and proclaim it. Like, you know, Isaiah talks about how beautiful are the feet of those who, who uh, proclaim the gospel of peace. <clears throat> now, the, since, really since the time of Christ uh, and the days of the apostles, the gospel has been under attack. And who's leading the attacks? Well, ultimately, it's Satan, right? And, and he seeks to corrupt the gospel. How do we know this? Well, just read the New Testament. You'll find instances where Christ and the gospel and the very purpose, uh, uh, the very name of Christ and the nature of Christ and things to do with Christianity, <clears throat> it was under attack. 1 Timothy 4 1 says this Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Okay, so in the latter times, technically the latter days began when Jesus was here. You know, um, the first John it says, Little children, it is the last time. And uh, Hebrew says, <coughs> God who had sundry times and diverse manners spoken unto us by the, the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Okay, so technically the last days began when Jesus was here. Because, and they're called the last days, the last time, because we're not at the beginning of God's program and plan of redemption anymore. We're not in the Garden of Eden. We're not in when God chose Abraham to be the one through whom the nation of Israel would come, through whom Christ would come. We're beyond that, so we're on the latter part of God's program. So I know a lot of times we speak about the last days, like not long before Jesus returns, and, and there's a sense that, you know, it's really the last days. If You know, some of the things we see shaping up in our day and age, yes. The signs of Jesus' return, we are seeing glimpses of them now. You know, like in Matthew 24. But he says, The Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Seducing means misleading spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay, so evil spirits, uh, demons, would 
mislead people and demons would come up with doctrines that would mislead people. And this would cause people who had, at least at one time outwardly claimed to adhere to the faith, they depart from the faith. They leave the Christian faith. <clears throat> they no longer believe it. They no longer believe the gospel. They no longer stand in the gospel. And so see, the gospel is under attack. <clears throat> now, are you prepared to stand for the gospel? There are some people that criticize it. Oh, you Christians, you think that your way is the only way to be saved. Well, that's right. Um, our faith is the only faith, faith that has scriptures that give clear, uh, precise um, <clears throat> prophecy about future events, and they come to pass. And they were they were fulfilled. Many of them in Jesus, which shows and proves that he is the Son of God. And he died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And we have documents based on eyewitness testimony from the first century, multiple eyewitness-based accounts that testify that they saw him after his resurrection. So yeah, that does set the Christian faith apart from many other faiths. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And uh, so the, the, this gospel, the, the corruption of the gospel, will, will, can follow like two different streams on the opposite ends, but they're both corruption to the gospel. And I'm thinking, first of all, of legalism and then antinomianism. So let's take a look at those two terms, legalism, then antinomianism, and explain what I'm talking about. Legalism, I mean that in the classical theological sense. Not like within the last hundred years where some fundamentalists may have certain rules that certain standards of dress maybe that they very strongly adhere to and people say, oh, you're legalistic. I don't, I don't mean it in that way. I mean legalism in the classical theological sense, which means adding works as a part of salvation. So legalism uh, corrupts the gospel by adding works to it. <clears throat> in the days of the Apostle Paul, he, he dealt with this. There were Jews who were teaching that to be saved, you had to trust Christ plus you had to keep the law. And uh, that was a corruption of the gospel. Galatians 1, 6 through 9, the Apostle Paul says this, If me or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Right? And uh, he says, I, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Okay, so notice that, that they had been called by God into the grace of Christ, into the gospel, the grace of God. But they had been deceived into accepting another gospel, a gospel that added the law to faith, that added some works to faith. He said, if me or an angel from heaven preaches any other gospel than that which I've preached unto you. Let him be accursed. Accursed means condemned. Anathema. Let him be damned. Why? Well, if he's going to distort the gospel and lead other people to hell, it'd be better that he just went now. Uh, that's how serious Paul was about this. So the message of the gospel uh, is that God will freely forgive those who believe in Jesus as a gift by his grace. And we receive this through faith and not by works, right? What does Ephesians 2, 8, and 8 through 10 say? For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Okay, so we're saved by grace through faith, not by works. But you know, it's interesting. The next verse says, 
For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Okay, so now notice that passage doesn't say, oh, we don't believe in good works. No, we believe in good works, but we do the good works after we're saved because we are saved, not in order to earn salvation. So we believe in good works to show that you love the Lord after you get saved, right? So we, we don't teach a, you know, a faith that doesn't produce any works as a result of it. Uh, so, you know, Romans 4 verses 2 through 8 talk about how Abraham uh, believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It says, but to, to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So so um, we do good works because we are saved in order to show that we're saved out of love and gratitude towards the Lord, but not in order to be saved. And salvation, by the way, is not a mixture of our works and of God's grace. It's all by grace by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to God alone be the glory. You know, Romans 11, 5 through 6 says, even so at this present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. Now get this, and if by grace, it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What that means is you can't mix grace plus works. And no one is saved by a combination of grace through faith and a combination of that and their works. Um, so that's legalism. But there's another corruption of the gospel. So you have the legalists on one hand who say, oh, you got to trust in Christ, but then you need to be baptized. Or you need to uh, take Holy Communion, or you need to live a good life, you know, and you need to keep on holding on to the end, and and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, no, it, it's all by grace through faith. Works have nothing to do with saving us. They have not, Works have nothing to do with keeping us saved. But works have everything to do with revealing the faith we have, and demonstrating our faith in God and our love for him. So you have the legalist adding works to grace through faith. But then the other end of the spectrum, you have antinomianism. Now what's antinomianism? Anti means against. Nomianism comes from the Greek word nomos, which is the law, the word for law, against law. In other words, lawlessness. Antinomianism is this distorted view of grace that says, well, if we're saved by grace, then God's moral laws are irrelevant. And it doesn't matter how we live. So God doesn't care how we live. Just so you pray the prayer and say the magic words, you know, Jesus, come into my heart and save me and forgive me. I take you as my Savior. I trust in you. Just say the words, get your ticket punched for heaven. And it doesn't really, you know, if you want to live a godly life, you can, but it really doesn't matter because you're saved by grace through faith. You see, that's the antinomianism, okay? And there's there's like a, a just a tiny sliver of truth in that, that we're, we're, we're saved by grace through faith and not by our works. But the error is that God doesn't, the, the claim that God doesn't care whether we live a godly life or not. He doesn't care if we obey him or not. It really doesn't matter. You you prayed the prayer, you said the words, uh, so now you're saved. Your ticket's punched for heaven. But <clears throat> let me read to you what the scriptures say about antinomianism. Now, the Bible doesn't use that word, but the concept is described here in Jude verses 3 through 4. He says, Brethren, when I gave all diligence to write to you of the common salvation, 
it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith. So see, not only should we uh, defend the gospel, but we should also earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered unto the saints. Okay, this faith that was given to the saints, he says, why do we need to earnestly contend for it? He says, there are certain men crept in unawares who before of old were ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. Okay, now listen to the description of these ungodly men that Jude says here. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? So notice these ungodly men, it says, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now what's lasciviousness? That's unbridled lusts. In other words, you do what you want to do, even if it's wrong. You don't, you don't make any effort to control yourself. You just indulge in sin. Okay? And, and a lot of times lasciviousness deals with sexual sin. Okay? So they, how do you turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness? Well, by you have an antinomian outlook. So, yeah, we're saved by grace through faith, not by our works. So it doesn't matter, you know, the way you live your life. So just go ahead and, you know, live in sin and immorality and, and all sorts of things. And and because uh, we're saved by grace. See, that's turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. And it says, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So God is referred to as the Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, they could have just mentioned him as Jesus Christ and God as God. But the emphasis is that they're denying God's lordship and the lordship of Christ. In other words, you don't need to submit to the authority of God as being the Lord of your life. Or Jesus as your Lord. Uh, no, just you say by grace through faith. And and so because of that grace, just go out and live any way you want. Okay, that's turning, that's antinomianism. That's turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Now notice Titus, Titus, <laughs> Titus 1, 16. They profess that they know God. They say, yes, I know the Lord. But in works, they deny him. They deny they know him by the way they live, because they live wicked, ungodly, godless lives. Being abominable, that means very wicked, and disobedient. So it's a lifestyle of disobedience and doing abominations. And unto every good work reprobate, reprobate, disapproved. So this, you know... Uh, None of us have perfect obedience, but we do have purposeful obedience. But not these clowns, not these ungodly men he talks about. Uh, but, but see, the gospel of the grace of God, when properly understood, this idea that you're saved not by your works, but by grace through faith and in what Jesus did, if properly understood, it does not promote antinomianism <clears throat> Paul anticipated this question in Romans 6 so Romans 6 verses 1 through 4 he says what shall we say then since, since we're saved by grace through faith you know if you read the rest of the book of Romans you'd see that so since we're saved by grace through faith without works what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Is this what the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith teaches? That <clears throat> Hey, let's continue in sin. Because the more we sin, God's grace will abound. You know, turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. He says, is, is that the conclusion? He says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, when we come to God 
uh, with a heart of repentance over our sin. That, and this is something that's produced by the Holy Spirit within us. A heart of repentance that says, God, I am sorry for my sins, and I want to be right with you. So, I, I, you know, I know I don't have a, a power within me, but I, I want to turn from my sin to you, and I want to follow you. I, w- I want to live differently. I want you to change my life. I mean, I want to be right with you. I want to have the forgiveness of sins by your gift of grace, but uh, I'm willing to go a different direction. Uh, Jesus, I want you to, you know, take control of my life and be my Lord. I'm sorry for wanting to live my own life uh, my way, independently from you. So, so, th- so when we get saved, God makes it w- gives a change within our hearts that brings us to that point where we want to repent and turn to God. And so we, we die to sin when we come to Christ. He says, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And then he, he, he describes how when we got saved, we were baptized by the Holy Spirit <clears throat> into the body of Christ. So we were united with him in his death and in his resurrection. And our water baptism pictures this. So that that's what he says. Hey, don't you remember when you got baptized what that pictured? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? You know, when you get baptized the proper way, you're buried underneath the water, right, symbolically. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I mean, the whole idea of God saving us is to reconcile us to himself. For us to be made right with God and put in a right relationship with him. And and so, so the person we were before, the old man or the old woman, dies and is buried with Jesus. <clears throat> and now we're raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father to walk in newness of life. Now that's something we should have gotten and understood at the very beginning of our Christian life when we got baptized. That's what baptism pictures. So where, where does this antinomianism come from? Well, it comes from ignorance of the word, but it 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 also results from either not understanding or denying what repentance means and its importance and its relationship to saving faith and to the gospel and to salvation. Here's what I mean. What is repentance? It's, it's an important Bible word. Repentance comes from the Greek word metanoia. Meta means again, noia meaning to think or to f- reflect upon. It, it means to, to think again, to have a change of mind. But a change of mind about what? A change of mind about our sin and ourself and our relationship with God. What is it that caused the rift between mankind and God? Well, it's our sin. So that's what we repent of. That's what we have a change of mind about. So when we repent, you know, before we repent, we don't give a rip about God. We just want to live our life our own way. But when we repent, we recognize how our sins have offended God. And we are under God's wrath, and we're going to face his judgment. But God, in his love and mercy, made a way that we could be forgiven through Christ. So we're sorry for our sins. We respond with repentance. We're sorry for wanting to run our own life our way independently from God. We're sorry for our life of sin, and we want to be forgiven and made right with him. And we, you know, we, we don't want to live that way anymore. God gives us. Repentance. There are three different places in the Bible where it says repentance is a gift. Now, in one place it says, If God peradventure shall give them repentance. Then we find that God has granted repentance unto life, you know, to the Gentiles. Uh, and, and so God gives us repentance. And, and so 
when we come to God through faith in Christ, you see, repentance is a part of faith. It's a part of a saving faith. So uh, the prodigal son is Jesus' illustration and parable to show that there's more joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. So what did the prodigal son do? Remember, he was foolish and stupid and, and arrogant and know-it-all. Then he went and blew his entire fortune and he ended up in the pig's pen. And it says, when he came to himself, that's repentance. When he came to himself, and then it records, he changed his way of thinking about himself, about his sin, and his relationship with his father and with God. And he said, you know, I, I, I'm going to return to my father. I'm going to say to him, uh, I have sinned against you and against heaven. And Father, I no longer even deserve to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. You see his change in his attitude? I mean, he was estranged from his father, but now he wanted to go and be forgiven and reconciled with his father. And he changed the way he looked about his course of conduct. He realized and admitted that what he did was really foolish. And he didn't want to be foolish anymore. He wanted to be reconciled with his father. Total change in attitude, right? That's repentance. Jesus said that illustrates, uh, okay, when the son returned home, dad threw a party for him. Why? Because there is more joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. And you see, repentance uh, is the gospel that we can have forgiveness if we come to God through faith in Christ, it presupposes an attitude of repentance and that, that we have a, this desire to forsake our sin and to turn our heart from sin to God. And it's not a work. It's something that takes place inside our heart. That's why three different times it's described in the Bible that God gives it. Uh, that, or God grants repentance unto life. It's a working of the Holy Spirit within uh, a lost sinner. Jesus said, I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And uh, an, a, an attitude of repentance and a part of that being a part of saving faith. Do you know that Jesus instructed us when we present the gospel, he instructed us to preach repentance and to call people to repent of their sins, to put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. And you know, you're not putting your faith in your repentance. You're putting your faith in Christ. But repentance is a part of a saving faith. Um, Jesus said this when he was telling his disciples after his resurrection how he had fulfilled the scriptures. He says in Luke 24, 46 and 47, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. So see, he's talking about the gospel. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You hear what Jesus said? He said, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. So you preach people that they need to repent of their sins and turn to Christ and find remission of sins in his name through what, who he is and what he's done. And that message is to, is to go out to all the nations beginning at Jerusalem. Uh, Acts 20:21, 20, the Apostle Paul, that's what he taught. How do we know? He records it here. He says in Acts 20:21, 20, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, right? Same gospel for Jew and Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You hear that? That's what Paul said, repent, he testified to the Jews and to the Greeks. 
repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So you come to God, you have a heart of repentance toward God because of your sin, and you want to be made right with God. You want to be forgiven and and reconciled to God. And and you want to follow him. So you you repent towards God of your sin and you put your faith toward Jesus Christ as the means whereby you can be forgiven through his death and resurrection. That's Acts 20:21. 20, and four verses later, this is what Paul says. None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord to testify the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God. Now, according to Paul, the gospel of the grace of God it contains the message of repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, repentance is not a work. It's a gift that God gives you. It takes place inside your heart, in your mind. Uh, um, and, and a true saving faith uh, is accompanied by repentance. So it's like this. Suppose someone here's the gospel, and they say, well, I'm a wicked sinner, but I love my sin. I mean, I love being sexually immoral and, and a drunkard, and I, I steal if I want to, I lie if I want to, and I just love doing whatever I want to do. Sin's fun, so that's the way that I want to continue to live. Suppose a guy who has that attitude hears the gospel, and he says, wow, you know, hey, if I just pray the prayer and ask Jesus to save me and forgive me, I can get a get out of hell free card and I can just go on living my life the way I want. So man, what do I have to lose? Okay, yeah, I'll pray the prayer with you. Dear Jesus, please forgive me and save me. I believe you died on the cross and I trust you and your death on the cross alone for my forgiveness. Uh, and, and then he says some filthy curse words. And he goes out and lives the same wicked life that he lived before. You think that's a saving faith? I don't. What what kind of faith is that? The guy the guy still believes that God's way of living is stupid and his way of living is cool. And that's the way he wants to live his life. You call that faith in God? That that's not faith. That's unbelief. He doesn't believe in God, he believes in himself. So see, what I'm saying is that a biblical saving faith presupposes repentance. And so somebody that, like I just described, that, that's someone who would turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. They would profess that they know God, but in their works, they would deny him. <clears throat> so... Paul said in Acts 26, 20 through 23, uh, that he went to the Jews, then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. In other words, Paul preached that, hey, you need to repent and turn to God. You need to get saved. And after you get saved, you, you need to do live like you repented. Show by the way you live that you repented. That's the same message John the Baptist preached. And then he goes on and he says, uh, uh, For these, this cause the Jews caught me in the temple, and they went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continued to this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying no other things than that which pro the prophets and Moses did say, that Christ should come, that he should be the first that should rise from the dead, and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. Okay? So, that's antinomianism. It's a corruption of the gospel. Which is worse? Well, I'd say that legalism is worse than the antinomianism, frankly. That's my opinion. Because at least the antinomianists recognize and understand you're not saved by your works. Uh, it, it, I guess it's it's like... 
I would rather see someone be a Roman Catholic than a Muslim. I mean, at least with the Roman Catholics, at least it's a little closer to the truth than a Muslim. You see what I'm saying? Well, antinomianism and legalism are both wrong, but I'd say I'd rather have someone be an antinomian. They're a little closer to the truth, but still not hitting it on the head. So, the, the gospel proclaims forgiveness. The idea that you can have forgiveness and you're asking God for it presupposes a heart of repentance uh, in those who are seeking it. Um, now, having our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace not only means standing for the gospel and defending it and upholding it and trying to maintain its purity and keep it from being corrupted, we also have to be prepared and ready to proclaim the gospel to unbelievers around us. And someone might say, well, I'm not really sure what to say or what all the Bible verses I should use. Well, you can give somebody a tract and you can study and read. Uh, there are books, there are videos on YouTube that explain how to witness. Um, there are different guys who have written uh, books and courses on how to witness or, you know, ask your pastor, you know, if you, you're not sure. But if you don't know the words to say, one thing you can do is share your testimony of how the Lord saved you. Uh, and, and you know, a lot of times people who will not listen to the gospel, if you say, hey, you'd, if I could share with you from the Bible in a matter of minutes, how you could know for sure you'd go to heaven. I've had a lot of people say no. But if you share your testimony, a lot of times people are open to it. So um, we, we can share our personal testimony of how Jesus saved us and how we came to believe in him. You know, whenever I hear somebody presenting the gospel, I like to listen to how they do it. Because sometimes when you hear the way that someone else explains the gospel, um, it it makes it easier. To, uh, uh, there are things you can pick up that can make it easier for you and be helpful suggestions. So um, being prepared and ready to defend and to proclaim the gospel, that helps to protect us and keep us strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, you know, my presumption is that most people listening to this are already saved. You're already a Christian, but maybe there's an unbeliever who is listening to me. Maybe an antinomian, an antinomian or a legalist listening to me. You know, if you've been a legalist and you're trusting in your works partly to save you, why don't you transfer your trust from your works 100% to Jesus. Come to God with a heart of repentance and say, Lord, I, I'm sorry, I, I had it wrong. I thought that I could save myself by being good or that I still had to do works and I've been depending on my works to save me, but I understand that's erroneous. It's wrong. It's by grace through faith in you alone. So Lord, I'm transferring my trust from my works to you. I'm trusting in the blood of Jesus and your mercy and grace 100%. Jesus, come into my heart and life and save me and change me and make me the person you want to be. I'm willing to go a different direction than to follow you. That's my desire. Please forgive me and save me. And maybe there's an antinomian in, uh, listening to me. Um, you need to repent. Have a change of heart whereby you're sorry for your sins and you turn to God and, and uh, you ask him to save you and you, you embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior and ask God to come in and change your heart and make you the person he wants you to be. May God bless you and keep you and lift up his countenance upon you and may he give you 